Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his essay, Concrete Approaches to Investigating the Ontological Mystery, Gabriel Marcel talks at one point about the interrelation between the realm of the problems or the problematical as opposed to that of the mystery or mysterious and uh, the realm or world that is reduced to, you might say, not quite a playground, but a uh, field for techniques or if you prefer another translation, techniques. So what he's talking about here is a little bit broader than just ways of doing something like a set of dance moves or something you might learn from a YouTube tutorial. He's discussing everything that, that fits into the scope of technology, of disciplines, of procedures, algorithms, steps, everything that can be you might say, cordoned off or compartmentalized into a problem to be solved. And there's a, there's a very strong connection between these things. He expresses this very well in pointing out that there's really four aspects. He doesn't name this. This is me uh, denoting this for you. But there's four aspects to the world of the person and of the cultures that are particularly focused just on problems and lose sight of mystery and everything else that goes along with that. So this is what he calls a broken world at different points. He tells us the world of the problematical. So what is the world of the problematical? The world in which everything is looked at in terms of problems. Problems are things that can be formulated, things that can be solved or at least deferred. If we can't solve them right away, we can say why it is that we can't solve them. Uh, a limit case of this would be a mathematical problem. You know, the, the old things that you had in algebra class about the train that's headed off to Denver at 60 miles per hour with such and such a distance and another train is coming to meet it at 30 miles an hour. Where do they actually meet? That's a good example of a problem. Other uh, problems may have to do with, you know, things that are a bit more practical. You know, you, you look at your hands and you're like, Oh, I've cut myself. I need to go and find the, what, thing to clean it out and maybe some ointment to put on it and a Band-Aid or you might be, you know, say playing an instrument and you, you listen and, and the chord that you're playing, let's say it's a stringed instrument, doesn't sound right. Well, something must be out of tune. Let me play the different strings and see which of them or perhaps which two or three are out of tune with each other. Maybe you get yourself a pitch pipe, blow it on it and use, oh, that, that note is the right note. I need to, you know, tune this a little bit differently. What you're doing there is a technique and you're using that technique to solve a problem. So Marcel tells us the world of the problematical, the world in which everything is viewed in terms of a problem is the world of desire and of fear, which he says cannot be separated from one another. Why those two affectivities? Why not the world of pain and pleasure? Why not the world of uh, fear and hope? He, he has a long discussion about why he thinks Spinoza was wrong in opposing hope and fear. And Spinoza isn't the only person to do that, by the way. Why desire and fear? Because these are emotions that everybody can relate to and they tie in 
very closely with the realm of problems and techniques, as we'll see in just a moment. He says, this is also the world of the functional or functionalizable that he discusses at the very beginning of his essay. What is that? Well, everything is reduced down to functions and a human being is understood in terms of their vital, their psychological, their social functions without there being sort of a kernel of individuality that escapes those functions in, in a meaningful way, because it's quite possible to have individuality in, in a manner that's completely functionalized. Great example of this was Burger King's advertising campaign back when I was a teenager that stressed that you can have it your way, right? We will take your orders and make the, the Whopper however you like, meaning that they'll take the uh, ingredients that they have. And if you don't want onions on it, you don't have to have onions, but you're not going to have anything that's not in the panoply of the Burger King repertoire, right? Of, of different things you can put on it. You can put onions, you can put pickles, you can put ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, uh, you can put t tomatoes if you want to, um, but you're not going to get other things. That's just the way it works. And it's going to be done by somebody who has sliced all these things up ahead of time, who has so much time to get your Whopper prepared. Everything has been functionalized. That's not real individuality. Desire and fear are felt by individuals. There's nothing wrong with desire and fear, but a world that is primarily oriented in terms of desires and fears is a world that can be effectively compartmentalized and commoditized and turned into a matter of problems to be solved or techniques to be applied. If you think about what advertising does, most advertising is really appealing to those two things. Even if it appeals in some sense to hope, it's probably more appealing to fear. For example, FOMO, fear of missing out, right? I hope that I'll get to go to the concert. Why? Because I don't want to miss out on anything that I see on the TV or hear in some podcast that's going to be happening. I see in social media. Social media makes it possible to be even more involved with this. And social media would be some of these techniques or techniques that Marcel is talking about. So another aspect of this problematical world, as he says, is that it's the world where techniques of whatever kind reign supreme. So notice, he's not saying it's a world that's just of techniques, but techniques reign supreme. What does this mean? Think about some examples. Let's take dating, for, for example. Now, you could go and meet somebody if you want to uh, get involved with, with you know, some romantic partner by you know, meeting somebody in an organization that you belong to. A lot of people meet people in the workplace. But you could also get on a dating app, right, where you create a profile and everyone creates profiles in basically the same way, sometimes with a little bit of innovation, you know, funny stuff with the picture, uh, interesting stuff in how they account for themselves but it's really all the same platform. As a matter of fact, you could say, well, there's different dating platforms out there. Well, sure, but they all do pretty much the same thing. They're all set up in more or less the same way. Whether there's some very complicated personality test oriented one like uh, eHarmony or whether there's something that, that's oriented just to showing you who's in the area and uh, giving you their picture and allowing you to chat with each other. It's all mediated through technology and it all ends up reducing the interactions in a certain way. You might say, well, what, wait a second. What if you go on a date with the person? Sure. Now you're actually meeting face to face, which hopefully is the intention of it, right? Um, not just to date an avatar, but that could easily become something that's dealt with just in terms of functions sexual function, for example, or prestige function, or any other thing like that. And there's techniques. I mean, people come up with books about how you're supposed to pick up people who you're attracted to. Now, and that's not to say that any of this stuff actually works, but 
What's important here from Marcel's perspective is that techniques do reign supreme. They are what drives everything else. They're the things that dictate how we approach things, how we understand things. Now, all of these are interconnected. He tells us that there is no technique that is not or that could not be put directly at the service of a given desire or a given fear. And conversely, every desire and every fear will tend to create techniques geared towards its own ends. Every technique serves or can serve through, through mission creep or however you want to put it, a whole host of desires and fears. Every desire a person has will find somebody who will create a technique at probably a platform, an app for that, as we used to joke around when apps were becoming a big thing for dealing with that, that, that matter. Not everything is, is susceptible to that. Can you create an app to make somebody feel loved? They're making robots right now that simulate that. You know, they snuggle up with a person and, you know, warm up and maybe say little soothing things, but it's not quite the same thing as the satisfaction of that desire, unless a person's desires eventually get replaced by desires for that sort of stimulus, likewise fears. So he also says um, that, you know, what we've got here are these different things connected up with each other. These are all part and parcel of a world like that. Now, there are consequences. I was almost jokingly thinking I'd say there's problems that arise from this world, but they're, they're not actually problems as such. They're meta problems. Uh, so let's just call them consequences. One of the consequences that Marcel signals, I think something that many of us can relate to, because this is just as true in our time as it is in his own, he talks about sensing the global bankruptcy of techniques as a whole and feeling a sense of despair as a result. Why? He says that um, we have not ceased believing in techniques, that is, envisioning reality as an ensemble of problems to be solved. But we notice that some of the things that we frame as problems which Marcel would say they're not really problems, they're really mysteries, um, but we lose a sense of how to frame those. If we frame them as problems, we realize that techniques are not, are not going to help us with them, or if they do, it'll be more or less accidentally. You know, I'll give you an example. What's the right thing to say to somebody who's grieving? You know, you can say, I'm so sorry for your loss, and sometimes that helps, and very often that doesn't. Now, if your goal is just to like satisfy a social requirement, a social function, then you're off the hook. But if your goal was really to reach the other person and help them with this affective state of grief that they're in, then who knows? There are no hard and fast rules that govern this. This is not something that you'll be able to, through neuroscience or whatever other thing somebody comes up with, you know, develop an app or program or algorithm that will take care of things. So this is a, a big problem. The global bankruptcy of techniques, he says, is as clearly discernible as are its partial successes. To the question, what can humans accomplish? We still reply, humans are capable of what their technical abilities can accomplish. But at the same time, we cannot, we cannot but recognize that technical achievements are unable to save us from ourselves. So there is a whole range of things that techniques can't really get to. They might be helpful as apparatuses or as tools, but something has to be guiding, orienting, directing that tool. Another thing that Marcel signals is what he calls being taken over by techniques. This might be understood, you know, in, in by recourse to that old uh, slogan or motto to the person who has a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Um, what's going on in there? What's, what's in the background? The notion that techniques can solve everything 
and a over-reliance on them that makes us subject to them. He tells us these technical achievements are not able to save us from ourselves and even appear, as he says, to conclude the most sinister alliances with the enemy that each of us carries within himself. What does he mean there? Our, Our worst tendencies. The things that we haven't dealt with. Traumas, perhaps. Um, temptations. So he says, being taken over by techniques, what does this actually mean? It means becoming increasingly incapable of controlling them and become, becoming powerless to govern one's own power. We have freedom. We, we misuse the freedom and give it away to these techniques. So let's take some examples from social media. And let's do it on a base level and a meta level. So some people look to social media for affirmation of who they are and what they stand for and what kind of person they are. And it matters to them how many followers they have, how many people are paying attention to what they're doing, even if perhaps the follower count isn't really accurate because they've been muted or something like that. And it also matters how many likes they get. If it's on Twitter, I suppose if it's on Facebook or Instagram, resharing is very important as well. All of this is giving you signals about your value for other people. And if that's something that really matters to you, then you might start checking uh, all that very frequently, or you might start modifying your behavior and your desires start to circle around this more and more and more and more and more. You might on a meta level find yourself unable to tear yourself away from the computer screen or from your phone for any sustained period of time. Another great example of this is the sort of loops that we're able to create within human beings. Psychologists figured this out and people very quickly, business people figured out how to monetize this with video games. Think about how Candy Crush Uh, took in so many people, uh, getting them to spend so much time essentially there to to not just play around, but to look at advertisements or perhaps to become one of those whales who spends a lot on in-app purchases. These are examples of being taken over by techniques. We could talk about dating apps again and the unrealistic expectations that they raise for people, the the boredom and jaundiced eye that they they turn towards the people's just swiping over and over and over again or doing whatever else you have to do to move on to the next person. Some people actually get on to those with no intention of ever contacting anyone and just swipe and swipe and swipe. It's a way of killing time. Again, being taken over by your techniques. So he says that this control, for, this control of one's own power, which is the realization in the realm of the active life of what I've called second reflection or reflection at the second power, can only find its center or source of strength within recollection. These are things that quit becoming available for the person who is taken over by techniques, who sees the world in this way, who reduces the world in that way, who buys into that view of the world. He also talks about a sort of cosmic hubris that, again, we have more examples of in our own time because our technology has extended our capacities. He has a great example of the weather. He says... um, Some will object, saying that those most completely completely imbued with belief in techniques are forced to recognize there are vast domains over which techniques have no control. What matters, he says, is not this observation, but the way that the mind interprets it. How do we make sense of that? What attitude do we take towards it? He says, we're forced to admit we have no control over meteorological conditions, but the question is whether or not we judge it desirable and just that such control be given to us. The the more that one fits into this viewpoint, uh, losing the sense of the ontological, the more the one who has lost it will see his or her claims as limitless, extending to a sort of cosmic governance, 
because he or she will become less and less capable of inquiring about the credentials he or she has to exercise such authority. And when you think about the way that, for example, tech people or people enamored of tech who are you know, sort of dazzled by it, talk about how they are going to transform the world and they paint these incredible pictures and you know you start thinking about all the different things that would have to happen in order for that really to work and you see that they're blazing right over that why because they have a desire that that extends to the whole world they want to change it they want to make people different they want to make society different and there is a sort of pridefulness at the center of it. Where does that come from? An over-reliance, an incapacity to see anything other than in terms of problems to be solved, functions, fear and desire, and techniques. What happens in the end through all of this that, that Marcel is particularly concerned about is that people end up becoming incapable, at least at the moment, they could come out of it, they become incapable of imagining or entering and remaining in or participating in something that goes beyond the realm of techniques. And you see this sad spectacle over and over and over again. Parents who can only see the stats of their kids and can't actually look at their kids. People in hospitals being reduced down to vital signals and charts and what's, what's happening uh, and, and being only given a certain amount of time because that's all that this hospital system has rationed out for them for the greater good of everyone, right? Or at least the stockholders. And we could go on and on and on with examples of this, but Marcel thinks that these are intimately interconnected and they become a sort of brittle and yet thick, uh, you could call it superficial cover for anything ontological, anything with depth that would lie beneath. 